Hello, my name is Ryan Smith and I'm from the School of Public and International Affairs uh, at Baruch College, City University of New York. Um, and today I wanna to talk to you about race, ethnic and gender differences in accessing decision-making positions at work um, and why that inequality actually matters uh, in the long run for the life chances of people of color. Um, I'm gonna also talk about, um, start things off by talking about my primary research areas, just to set, set the stage here, and then discuss persistent inequality in job authority, why job authority is an important indicator of socioeconomic status, and also how do you go about operationalizing job authority for use in quantitative research. Then I wanna share with you some of my major research findings over the years, uh, and then conclude the discussion with a, a description of my new research directions. Okay, so with that said, let's let's launch right into it. Um, so one of my primary areas of research concerns workplace stratification. Uh, and again, the primary indicator or status that I use in that research is simply called job authority. Um, I'm gonna use that term interchangeably with um, decision-making power, decision-making authority. I wanna be referring to authority elites, that is to say people who exercise authority in the workplace. And I'll get more definitional um, as we go along here. But the second major area is that of racial attitudes in America, studying racial attitudes, using um, national data sets such as the general social surveys to study change over time in racial attitudes. Um, and then most recently, I've sought to converge those two research areas into the study of um, the authority attitudes of, or really racial policy attitudes of authority incumbents, those who exercise positions of power and influence at work. Um, you know, the goal there is to, you know, at least raise the question, what happens if these individuals who exercise power at work are basically uh, against policies that are designed to, to bring uh, equality uh, within the context of the workplace. So with that said, let me just fast forward here to um, a description of, um, you know, the last 28 years of my life, actually. Um, I've been involved in what I call evidence-based teaching, research, and consultation, focused on all three sectors of the economy. Um, before they dubbed it uh, the study of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or before consultation um, uh, conveyed, you know, around those concepts, uh, you know, I was sort of out there, you know, doing that kind of um, work. Uh, and of course, these days we have all kinds of labels, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the list will continue to be updated, I'm sure. Uh, but the point here is that I've been involved in all of these sectors of the economy, you know, trying to bring understanding to the nature of workplace inequality, you know, why it exists and hopefully, you know, how to go about alleviating it, alleviating it. Okay. All right. So you know, during that time, I've actually come to agree with Barbara Reskin's, um, you know, well quoted statement here where she says, inequality at work does not just happen. It occurs through the acts and the failures to act by the people who run and work for organizations. So people are actors, um, organizations are not these inanimate entities. Um, they are influenced, um, you know, by the people who particularly have decision-making authority at work. Okay. Um, in most white collar, particularly your higher paying positions within the economy in the U.S., and this may be true at other places around the world where there is a critical mass of people from diverse backgrounds, the normative context looks simply like this. That is to say that white males typically are on top, followed by white women, and there's usually a huge gap between white men and white women. And then there's another significant gap between white women and racial minorities uh, who tend to be clustered at the very bottom of these organizational hierarchies. And the consequences of, 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 of such positioning um, um, you know, redounds negatively on the life chances of, of people of color. One way to see this 
um, looking at real data is to observe um, based on the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission information, the percent of officials, managers, executives, and senior, and senior level officials by race, ethnic, and gender status. Um, this slide here demonstrates that normative context that I spoke about, and it exemplifies the kind of persistent inequality that has gone on for quite a long time within the context of the workplace. Uh, so if you, just to point out a couple of obvious patterns here, so white men um, represent this top line here, um, you know, roughly 58% of officials and managers from 2000 to 2006. And then if you change the title um, to executive senior level officials and managers, um, their numbers actually you know, go up to, to over 60%. And then the second line here represents that of white women, Again, a significant gender gap between white men and white women, um, and only you know surpassed perhaps by the racial, ethnic, and gender gap between men and women of color who were clustered at the bottom of this uh, chart here. Okay, now if you were to blow up what's going on at the bottom here, you will see something that looks like this, um, where racial minorities are clustered at the bottom. This line here, three and a half percent um, of black men are labeled as officials and managers throughout this time period, 2000, 2000, you know, close to 2006. Um, after 2006, you have a number of things taking place, the economic recession, and you can see how, you know, there's this huge drop off here that uh, disproportionately affects racial minorities. The only group that it does not affect as much um, is that of Asian American men, where you, where you can see a steady increase over time in their representation among these high-level decision-making positions. Um, and we're going to return to that example of Asian men later on in the presentation. But the net result of this persistent form of inequality is um, just rampant discrimination allegations and also discrimination lawsuits. One way to look at this trend over time is again to access equal employment opportunity data. Uh, the EEOC tracks change over time in discrimination allegations. These are mere allegations. And this chart simply represents um, a 20 year time period where race and sex um, sort of maintain their you know, hegemony over other um, categories, protected categories, um, among the, the, the highest discrimination allegations. Um, what has happened here in recent years is that retaliation has significantly surpassed other uh, protected categories um, as a discrimination allegation. So what typically happens in this case is that an individual can bring an initial complaint, such as a sex discrimination um, you know, complaint, and then they may face some retaliation by their employer. Um, and according to the law, you're able to bring essentially a second complaint under the legal theory of retaliation. And so it, it speaks volumes that retaliation is sort of this go-to move that organi many organizations take when they are faced with a discrimination allegation, okay? Um, another way of understanding um, the impact of deep um, racial and gender inequality at work is to look at actual settlements um, and the cost of those settlements, the cost to organizations such as Coca-Cola, um, who settled in 2000 um, with $192.5 million spread across uh, 2,200 plaintiffs. Texaco was next in line as the highest at $176 million um, spread across 1,400 plaintiffs. Um, not just racial discrimination, but also sex discrimination lawsuits are very costly to the organization as well. And here we see um, Home Depot back in 97 um, um, had to, or were forced to settle at $104 million across 25,000 plaintiffs, um, where it was found that, um, uh, you know, significant sex discrimination cases, they did not want this to go uh, to full trial, so they settled. Um, again, at $104 million, um, which is really, you know, not all that much 
uh, when you're splitting that among 25,000 um, employees, okay? So the common denominator in these discrimination cases is that when you look deeply at them, women and racial minorities simply lack the kind of decision-making authority that would affect the kind of change that's needed in these organizations. Now, when I talk about decision-making positions, I'm gonna be talking about, um, you know, hiring managers, think supervisors, think, you know, any kind of senior leaders, executives, even recruiters, anyone who can serve as a gatekeeper, making decisions about who gets access to the workplace, who gets promoted, you know, up the organizational hierarchy, et cetera, et cetera. Those are individuals who are in decision-making positions, okay? And um, who gets access to those positions matter and the consequences of having those decisions, uh, you know, decision positions matter as well. Okay, um, the theoretical foundation for this kind of uh, research flows from, among others, but Max Weber is, you know, sort of the go-to guy. Uh, his quote here that the important difference between power and authority consists in, in the fact that whereas power is essentially tied to the personality of individuals, authority is always associated with social positions and roles. So he argues authority is therefore a form of legitimate power. And so what I'm going to be discussing is basically inequality when it comes to accessing legitimate power at work. To be distinguished from other forms of authority, like charismatic authority, which goes with you wherever you go, the power that I'm talking about and the authority that I'm talking about is confined to the context of the workplace. Okay? So let's look at how job authority um, or what it is and also how it's operationalized for quantitative research. So there are essentially, you know, when you survey the literature, five dimensions of authority. First, the very familiar ownership, meaning control over the means of production. You know, you know, you know, are you self-employed? You know, you know, you know, do you own this factory, et cetera, et cetera. But then there's span of control, which can be operationalized as an integral variable, where you're simply looking at the number of people under one's direct supervision, their sanctioning authority, whether or not an individual has influence over pay, promotion, whether they can hire and fire people. There's so-called decision-making authority, which is specific to having control over products, services, budgets, and policies, such as diversity, equity, and inclusion policies. And then there's hierarchical authority um, where you, you're, you're simply looking at where people are located within the hierarchy of organizations, okay? And where you're located within the hierarchy of organizations matters for all kinds of other outcomes, um, such as income, benefits, and things of that nature, okay? So why is it important as a measure of socioeconomic status? Well, we know from past research that job authority is a valued attribute of jobs. It definitely confers status on an individual um, and people find it intrinsically rewarding as well. Um, it has been noted that the study of job authority has been declared sociology's chief contribution to the study of earnings inequality. And it is in fact one of the essential ways in which the financial rewards of work are allocated. Okay? But not only that, but job authority is correlated with a whole lot of other important variables as well, such as job satisfaction, autonomy over one's own work, um, class consciousness, et cetera, et cetera. So it's an important dimension of socioeconomic status um, along with educational attainment, along with occupational attainment, okay? Um, and then of course, those who exercise authority, those decision makers, they get to decide the direction and the strategy behind all kinds of policies, particularly diversity, equity, and inclusion policies. And that's gonna come in handy, by the way, later on uh, throughout this discussion. Okay, if you're interested in conducting research in this area, may I suggest two places to start? First, there's an annotated bibliography that I put together with my colleague, George Wilson. Um, and in that bibliography, we look at um, US-based data sets, international data sets. Um, we're looking at different, um, you know, theories and things of that nature. And so it's a good place to start. 
And then, of course, there's a piece that I wrote way, way, way back in the day um, in the Annual Review of Sociology, which breaks down the theory and research uh, surrounding the study of race, gender, and authority in the workplace. Okay. Now, with that, let's look at some explanations as to why race, ethnic, and gender inequality and authority persist uh, in the workplace. And I'm going to look at uh, micro, macro, and meso explanations just to give a, an overview of the different dimensions in which inequality resides uh, on this issue. So first looking at the micro findings from prior research, what we found is that women and racial minorities receive lower authority, authority returns to their human capital investments. And so when we hearken back to that slide, which showed that Asian men were in fact on the increase from basically, uh, you know, 2% of, you know, you know, of those higher level positions to now 4.5%, um, you know, that kind of progress is definitely evident. Um, however, you know, at that pace, it would take, you know, hundreds of years in order for them to reach parity, all else being equal with that of white women and white men. Um, but they have the highest level of educational attainment but yet they receive a much lower authority return to their educational investments, okay? Then there's the link between family structure and authority, um, which tends to be much stronger for women than that of men. And this is consistent with a lot of the gender literature. Um, in this case, we find that marriage actually hurts the authority chances of white women. But in contrast, black women and also Latinas appear to receive a marital bonus. So being married for black women and Latinas seems to enhance their chances of reaching levels of authority in the workplace, while the opposite is true for white women, okay? Um, looking at the macro explanations, a few structural accounts, we know that wherever women and minorities are clustered, um, where they are disproportionately concentrated, um, such as the South, large urban areas, the public sector, co-ethnic work settings, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, their authority chances are hampered, okay? Um, so where they are disproportionately concentrated, their authority chances are in fact hampered. However, in those same areas, that's where they tend to have authority if they have authority at all, okay? So structural accounts matter. Um, then there are these meso explanations that are interesting as well. First, looking at the concept of the glass ceiling. So what we find is that white male supervisors who actually are employed in non-traditional work settings defined by white males who report to women and minority supervisors, that's a rare phenomenon in the American economy. The data shows that they receive more income and retirement benefits than white men and other groups who actually report to white men directly, okay? And this little cartoon on the right side here sort of illustrates this kind of um, discrepancy. Uh, the gentleman says, at the water cooler, he says, I don't mind working for a woman. I do, however, hate being paid like one, okay? Then there's the glass ceiling phenomenon. And we find that relative to white men, both Blacks and Hispanics experience what we call increasing inequality at higher levels of power. Uh, and that's how we define glass ceilings, by the way. And both Black women, or but Black women, I should say, experience a particular virulent form of this inequality. And we um, suggest that that's a form of direct discrimination, okay? So Black women have a more difficult time uh, you know, breaking through that glass ceiling um, uh, than these other um, minority groups, okay? Um, another area is that of networks, okay? Black women are more likely than other groups to utilize network assistance, according to uh, our research. Uh, and they use that assistance um, that is provided by Black men. They use that to access positions of authority at work. Not only that, but we also have findings for homosocial reproduction, a, a, a term um, made popular by Rosabeth Moss Cantor, where people were actually closed out of positions of power and influence um, based on their identity status. And so one of the major findings that we 
come across is that most groups actually attain power using homosocial reproduction, meaning reproducing people who look like them. But we also find that white men continue to dominate in those positions, mainly because they, they are there in disproportionate numbers in the first place. And so we coined this phrase, possession is nine tenths of the law, uh, you know, relative to this particular uh, result. Okay, so who happens to be there first has the lion's share of power and authority to keep people like them in those positions, although everybody engages in this when they have the opportunity to do so. Okay, now another concept that we coined is this term called um, bottom up ascription. And when I say coined, it means that, you know, we're using this to describe, you know, some of the results that we come across. We didn't invent the concept or the term, um, but it's very apt to describe some of our results. Um, same thing with class ceilings, uh, and same thing with, um, you know, homosocial reproduction, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, what we found is that racial minorities are more likely to have authority over other racial minorities if they have it at all. Also, those who are subordinate racial minorities, meaning those who don't have authority, tend to have to report to a minority superior. Okay, so this gives you a picture of what the workplace looks like for most people of color. And minorities are more likely than majority group members to exercise authority at the bottom of organizational hierarchies. Okay, bottom up ascription. That takes us now to part two of the presentation where the attempt is to close in on some of the mechanisms that actually generate and sustain inequality when it comes to authority at work. And I wanna do that by exploring the racial attitudes of those who exercise decision-making authority at work. Right. So um, my colleague and I, Matthew Hunt, we're looking at white supervisor and white subordinate beliefs about black-white inequality in study number one. And let me just take you right to the um, rationale for why this is worthy of investigation. We know that whites continue to dominate positions of authority at work, as you just witnessed, most Blacks in high-paying positions, they actually report to white supervisors, and they work mostly alongside and actually compete with white coworkers, competition over promotions, pay raises, benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So that, again, is part of the normative context of the white-collar workplace. And then we know that white supervisors tend to evaluate the performance and citizenship traits of their own group much more favorably than members of minority groups, okay? based on prior research. Other research points to the phenomena called the ultimate attribution error, whereby any positive performance on a part of racial minorities is viewed as luck or exception to the rule. A negative performance tend to confirm the stereotype and is therefore attributed to innate characteristics. Um, and then of course, attitudes regarding social inequality are shaped by the individual's position within the context of the workplace. So that's why we think that it's important to study the stratification beliefs of whites who exercise authority and whites who don't exercise authority within the context of the workplace. Now, other matters to consider is that any kind of organizational change effort is gonna be filtered through white managers and white supervisors in predominantly white workplaces. So what they have to say about policies that are designed to equalize opportunity matters. One particular policy important that we're gonna spend some time talking about is that of affirmative action and how whites with power and without power conceive of affirmative action, okay? All right, so the data comes from the general social surveys. I'm not gonna belabor this particular slide, but we're using data across these two studies from 1972 to 2018. Um, and we have over 11,000 cases that we're working with. Um, so this first slide here that I wanna share with you um, is a glimpse at white supervisors' beliefs about black-white inequality. And the, the question that comes from the GSS is, on average, blacks have worse jobs, income, and housing uh, than white people. Do you think these differences are due to, and they're given you know, four possibilities here, lack of motivation, lack of education, or is it due to discrimination or the fact that, or the idea, the concept, the stereotype that Blacks have less inborn ability? 
And uh, you can see that the lack of motivation explanation is sort of at the top here. Um, and it, you know, basically remains so until it reaches parity with the lack of the lack of education explanation in the more recent time period here. Um, you see that those who believe that discrimination is the cause um, you know, of the differences between blacks and whites, that's significantly declined over time. Uh, and fortunately, those who believe that blacks simply have less inborn ability, that is declined as well. Um, however, it's 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 definitely present. Okay, all right. With that, a couple of takeaways are worth noting at this juncture, and that is that when whites in authority believe that blacks simply lack the motivation to get ahead, the question becomes: How does that impact um, their ability to impartially consider blacks for employment and promotion opportunities? And also, if those in authority increasingly believe that racial discrimination is not is not a factor limiting the life chances of Blacks, then how does that weigh against their charge to adhere to anti-discrimination policies, enforce affirmative action edicts, um, you know, and endorse diversity policies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? How does that matter, okay? And so that takes us to, you know, the bottom line of this first study, and that is that the attitudinal patterns, as I note here, along with the persistent inequality um, you know, that I pointed to earlier, provide an attitudinal pretext, and we would argue a social context for, per for persistent bias against Blacks. We believe that that bias has enduring consequences, um, you know, for the life chances of Blacks. And also, when it comes to policies like affirmative action that are designed to bring about equality of opportunity in the workplace, okay? And as you know, uh, you know, affirmative action is, you know, from a Supreme Court perspective, uh, is on the chopping block. So this is this is contemporary relevant um, information here. Uh, and so let's look at some higher profile faces of affirmative action just to, you know, put this in a broader uh, context. So person like Clarence Thomas, for example, Supreme Court justice, he was a beneficiary of affirmative action at Yale. Um, but he is also a strong opponent against affirmative action. Um, Sonia Sotomayor, a beneficiary of affirmative action as well, but a proponent of affirmative action, right? Um, another beneficiary, um, the historian, Harry Lewis Gates Jr., um, a beneficiary and a proponent as well. Not only that, but also Cornell West, um, the philosopher, beneficiary and proponent. In other words, these individuals were not for affirmative action, according to them, would have not would not have gotten access to, you know, some of the most elite universities in the country, meaning they would not have been able to prove once there that they could compete on par with their white counterparts. And compete is what they did. And of course, they went on to have very successful careers. These individuals are high profile, but they represent lesions of other women and also people of color who benefited from affirmative action, uh, but who would not have gotten in to those organizations, uh, you know, those colleges and universities, um, you know, were it not for the policy. Okay, study number two hones in a little bit um, um, closer to this issue of, of affirmative action. And in this study, we're looking at what white supervisors and subordinates believe, particularly about affirmative action, and then framed differently, we're looking at, um, you know, whether they support preferences where they're aimed at Blacks versus whether they support preferences where they're aimed at women, um, you know, because those are two different, as we will see, um, ideas in the minds of many people. Okay, so let's quickly look at some of these findings. Um, so this slide here looks at the percent of white supervisors believe that whites are very likely or somewhat likely hurt by affirmative action. And you can see that um, the percent declined from 1990 to 2014 from 74% to 58%. And then the decline among white subordinates was much less. However, going from 69% to 61%. And the problem though in this chart, although we see these declines, is that still a majority, a healthy majority of whites regardless of whether they have authority or not at work, believe that whites are hurt by affirmative action. And so that raises the question, how do 
these beliefs influence how affirmative action policies are implemented and shepherded within the context of the workplace. Okay. And the next item here looks at opposition to affirmative action, and it shows that opposition actually varies depending on who the targeted group happens to be. So in this particular slide, we see that more than a majority of white supervisors and subordinates oppose the preferential hiring and promotion, um, you know, when the targeted group are perceived to be Blacks, okay? 58% of white supervisors, 59% of white subordinates. And, but when the perceived beneficiaries are women, only 35% of white supervisors and about a quarter of white subordinates oppose such policies, okay? All right, rushing along here, looking at some of the multivariate results um, when it comes to who believes whites are hurt by affirmative action, net of a whole bunch of variables, we find that white women are more likely than white men to, en to endorse the idea. Um, whites who actually work in the public sector, we found, and this is a relatively new finding, that, um, you know, so whites in the public sector are more likely than their private sector counterparts to support this concept. And when it comes to who opposes racial preferences at work, we find that whites who are employed in all or mostly all workplaces relative to whites who are in more integrated workplaces uh, oppose racial preferences at work. And it comes as no surprise that Republicans more so than non-Republicans, um, you know, oppose racial preferences at work um, and this is especially true among white Republicans who happen to be supervisors, um, you know, relative to, um, you know, whites who do not exercise authority at work. So bottom line, so whites who exercise decision-making authority at work and white subordinates, they largely oppose one of the most effective governmental policies designed to equalize opportunity at work. And this opposition can take many forms, including direct direct manipulation of the policy. And let me just give you one anecdote, and then we're going to shut things down. Uh, a recent article in the New York Times um, noted how Wells Fargo instituted what's called a diverse slate policy, which is basically a form of affirmative action, mandated women and people of color um, should in fact be interviewed, at least 50% of them um, should be candidates interviewed for positions earning $100,000 or more. The policy, as you may have read about yourself, was suspended after an employee complained that he was being forced by his bosses to conduct fake interviews for positions that had already been filled. And so 12 other employees actually told a similar story. So the bottom line here is that authority matters. Even the most well-intentioned and the most well-conceived policies are subject to the whims of authority elites, okay? My conclusion, referring back to Barbara Reskin's quote, inequality at work does not just happen. It occurs through the acts and the failures to act by the people who run and work for organizations. I thank you for listening.